How y'all living, my chooms and chumbadas? Hope you're all having a preem week. So on my channel, I have gone over many treatments, some that work, like finasteride minoxidil, as well as others that don't work, like Nutrafol, Viviscal, or the Brute Flu band. And even though in my research on various hair loss treatments, I have come across some options that are promising, yet fall outside of the mainstream on hair loss treatments, such as Fluoridil and Stamoxidine, I usually end up recommending that people stick with the clinically proven treatments. This is because finasteride and minoxidil are both extremely effective, especially when used together, and they are FDA-approved medications, which means they have far more research than your average hair loss medication, which is lucky to, lucky to even have a single randomized control trial. That being said, there is definitely room for innovation in the hair loss industry, and as good as finasteride and minoxidil are, there will still be a small number of outliers who are not optimal responders to this stack. Of course, I should emphasize being a non-responder to minoxidil and finasteride is not common. The majority of people who think finasteride and minoxidil aren't working are either confusing an initial shed with ineffectiveness, or they're misinterpreting a lack of regrowth as a sign that drugs aren't working, when in reality, maintenance is often the best thing we can hope for. So, when tackling hair loss, we have treatment options that fall under two categories. First, we have antiandrogens like finasteride, dutasteride, or fluoridyl that treat hair loss by going after the underlying problem with, this, with hair loss, which is DHT in the scalp of individuals who have androgenic alopecia. And since DHT destroys the scalp hair, treating DHT will often be enough to solve hair loss even by itself, which is why finasteride will usually work well enough as a standalone treatment for the majority of people. The other category of hair loss treatments are hair growth stimulants, which most famously would include minoxidil. And there are some lesser known growth stimulants like, you know, there's a uh, stamoxidine and minoxidil derivatives, although none of these have ever been shown to be anywhere close to being as effective as 5% minoxidil, but there is still nevertheless some research behind them. But is there any other pathway to target hair loss other than through a treatment from these two categories? Well, potentially there is. And in order to better explain this, we have to go balls deep into the mechanism behind androgenic alopecia, and specifically, we have to see if there's anything else to it other than just DHT destroying the scalp. So, most of us already know at this point that androgens, specifically DHT, dihydrotestosterone, is what destroys the hair follicles in individuals who are sensitive to androgenic alopecia. But how does it actually do that? Well, the one mechanism in which DHT destroys the hair follicle is that DHT decreases IGF-1, which is a hormone responsible for promoting angiogenesis, which is the promotion of new capillaries which feed blood and oxygen directly to each individual hair follicle. Remember, each of your hair follicles is its own individual organ, so it's not as simple as just increasing blood flow to the scalp. Otherwise, anything that increases blood flow to the scalp would work, like, you know, ACE inhibitors or cardiovascular training, but we know that is not the case. We know that's not it's not as simple as just increasing blood flow to the scalp. You can kind of think of it like your hair being a building being destroyed by a fire within and water being your blood. You could spray as much water onto the building as you want, but if DHT keeps causing IGF-1 to shut the windows, the water is not going to be able to reach the fire inside of the building and the building is still going to be destroyed. Your hair follicles are the same way. Without an adequate capillary bed, then your hair follicles will be deprived of oxygen and inevitably die even if you have the cardiovascular health of an Olympic marathoner because the blood will not reach your hair and the hair will die and be replaced with collagen deposits which are basically just scar tissue. Now before you ask, no, you cannot supplement IGF-1 directly to treat hair loss. This has been tried and it only works for people who have a genetic mutation that causes a low production of IGF-1 like Larin syndrome but in healthy individuals IGF-1 supplementation not only doesn't help but it's been shown to possibly be counterproductive, and I have a video about IGF-1 and hair loss which goes more in depth about this, and I'll link it below if, in case you guys want to learn more about that. So, it seems pretty clear cut about how to fight hair loss. We just go ahead and lower our DHT with finasteride to stop hair loss, and then add a growth stimulant on top of that, like minoxidil, to promote additional hair growth of the dermal papilla cells, and then you'll be able to stop hair loss and promote new growth. I mean, that's all there is to it, right? But is there any possible pathway besides just a hair growth stimulant and an anti-androgen that we can address 
tests that can make treating hair loss more effective and the very small number of people where finasteride and minoxidil alone are not enough? Well, it turns out the answer is maybe. And that leads us to the topic of today's discussion, SM04554. And it's called that because it doesn't have a trade name yet as it's still undergoing investigation in clinical trials. So what is SM04554? Well, listening to the name, it reminds me of other experimental hair loss treatments like RU5841 or CB0301, but as it turns out, this one is neither a growth stimulant or an antiandrogen. It is in fact its own unique beast known as a WNT stimulator. I don't know if this is the correct correct pronunciation, but henceforth I'm going to refer to WNT as WINT just because I think it rolls off the tongue a little bit better. So SM04554 stimulates the WINT pathway, but who cares? What is the WINT pathway and why should anybody care about it? Well, the WINT pathway is a mechanism that stimulates the nucleus of many types of cells, including the dermal papilla cells, to create proteins that are important for cell growth. This figure shows that when it is activated, the cell gets an increase in beta cat which is not to be confused with beta carotene, which is a vitamin A bioequivalent. Beta catenin, on the other hand, is a protein that goes into the nucleus and activates certain genes to produce proteins, so it's kind of like a hormone as in it controls the physiology of the cells. Specifically, as it relates in the hair, the Wnt pathway can stimulate dermal papilla stem cells to turn into regular dermal papilla cells. So in case you guys don't know what a stem, a stem cell is, what it is is that it's basically a precursor cell that can turn into almost any other kind of cell. So in the case of the Wnt pathway, the stem cells will turn into dermal papilla cells which are the cells that grow hair that your DHT is trying to destroy. So that's a good thing. So what does any of this have to do with androgenic alopecia? Well, it turns out the Wnt pathway is affected by DHT. And since the Wnt pathway promotes cell growth of the hair follicles, it may be that you can kind of get around the bad effect of DHT by stimulating the Wnt pathway without actually having to lower DHT on the scalp, which would potentially make SM04554 an alternative to finasteride without affecting androgen levels at all. So the theory is interesting, but what about the studies which correct corroborate the theory? Well, fortunately, there is some good existing research looking at the interaction between DHT and the Wnt pathway. So there is a study, which I'll link below, which examines what is known as the androgen paradox. The androgen paradox, for you guys who don't know, explores the interesting observation that DHT only hurts hair growth on the scalp and not the rest of the body. Well, it's a known fact that there is more DHT in scalp of balding areas than there is in non-balding areas in people with androgenic alopecia. And that's because there is more 5AR activity in balding scalp than non-balding scalp. So it's not as simple as just some hairs fall out because they are more genetically sensitive to DHT. It really is an issue of certain hairs having more DHT than other hairs. So keep in mind, we're not talking about DHT in the blood. That's completely irrelevant. We're talking specifically about DHT in the hair follicle. Men with androgenic alopecia still have the same blood DHT levels as non-balding men. The difference is, is that they have more DHT in their scalps than non-balding men. So if DHT is benign in most hairs like body and facial hair, then why is it that it's so destructive to scalp hair? So this study tries to explain that by looking at the effect of DHT on the Wnt pathway. The researchers in this study looked at the effect of different concentrations of DHT on hair growth and on this Wnt pathway, and also they looked at substances, substances that inhibited and stimulated the Wnt pathway. The bottom line is that lower levels of DHT stimulated hair growth and stimulated the Wnt pathway, while higher levels of DHT inhibited hair growth and inhibited the Wnt pathway. So if there's too much DHT in your hair follicles, it shuts down the Wnt pathway and that inhibits hair growth. So this may be another mechanism by which DHT harms hair growth in your scalp. Too much DHT inhibits the pathway and prevents hair growth. So with something like finasteride, we know this works because with it, uh, we have the option to simply just lower our DHT, which will then stimulate the wind pathway, which will in turn help stop hair loss. But with something like SM04554, we can actually stimulate the wind pathway directly without changing our DHT levels at all and possibly get the same effect since the end result is still going to be an increased function of the wind pathway, which promotes hair growth. So different mechanisms, but similar outcomes is what we're talking about here. At least that's the theory. So let's look at the research that explores this hypothesis on SM04554's mechanism. 
So there had been some preliminary animal studies that looked at SM04554, and I'll link one below. In this study, male mice had their hair removed with Nair, which is just a chemical that removes hair, but it burns really, really badly, so I don't recommend it. But anyways, the mice were given SM04554 topically, or they were given just an inactive solvent as a control to be compared to the group using SM04554. And various types of mice and also incredibly adorable mini pigs were also tested using different amounts of SM04554. And before you ask, no, the mini pigs were not harmed. They just took skin biopsies from them, so thank goodness for that. But anyways, hair counts from all the subjects as well as different hair types were assessed. They measured amounts of beta-catenin in the cells, which remember is the protein which is activated by the Wnt pathway. And basically, in all the animal models tested, there was an increase in hair growth and an increase in the number of hair follicles when using topical SM04554 compared with the inactive solvent. Beta-catenin was increased in hair follicles as well, showing that the wind pathway was being activated, indicating SM0454, uh, sorry, SM0454, it's a long number, keep in mind, it indicates that it may actually help with hair growth, as does stimulating the wind pathways. Now, I know this was just an animal study, but keep in mind that they didn't just use rodents, they used sweet and adorable mini pigs, and pigs are unique in the sense that their skin is very similar to humans, and the animals in general are very closely related to humans, which makes them very valuable for research, and that's also why pigs are sometimes used for things like xenotransplantation of organs, such as heart valves, so it's pretty fucked up if you think about it that we eat them, since they're so closely related to us, it's, you know, it's kind of like cannibalism if you think about it, but that's a subject for another day, so moving on. SM04554 is being investigated as a full-blown FDA-approved treatment, which means it has to go through three phases to meet approval. And so far, there have been phase one and phase two human studies reported on. The images I'm going to show you are from a set of slides provided by the drug company Samumed, and that's the company that makes SM04554. You know, actually, truth be told, they weren't provided by the company. I actually stole them from their website, so I hope they don't mind. But anyways, what you can see from these first two studies is the Wnt pathway theory we talked about. Namely, that DHT inhibits the Wnt pathway, but you can stimulate the Wnt pathway with SM04554 to theoretically counteract the bad effects of DHT without directly suppressing DHT the way finasteride does. The next slide then shows some animal research similar to what we talked about earlier, showing faster hair growth in shaved mice with SM04554 compared to just treatment with an inactive solvent. The next figure shows improved hair growth with SM04554, and it shortened the telogen inactive phase and accelerated the antigen growth phase of the hair follicles, so, that, so, so far this is a good sign. This summary slide indicates that SM04554 does what it's supposed to do in mice, and we already looked at the mini pig study, but what about with humans? Well, in phase one studies, it appeared safe, though we should note that some of this stuff is absorbed systemically as they found low concentrations in plasma. Phase one studies are done in healthy subjects to make sure there are no obvious safety risks, so phase one isn't to assess a long-term safety or efficacy profile, but rather to make sure the drug is initially tolerated well, which it fortunately was. In phase two studies, a treatment, uh, a treatment is evaluated for its efficacy, dosing, and safety. And in the case of SM04554, this was tested in 302 subjects with androgenic alopecia and was a randomized study of two different doses of SM04554 at a 0.15% and a 0.25% compared with a placebo. Hair growth was assessed by photographs and by subject questionnaires. At the conclusion of this study, the drug seemed safe. However, interestingly enough, it was the 0.15% dose and not the 0.25% dose that seemed to have the greatest effect, as you can see on these graphs, which really emphasizes the importance of phase two trials, since more is not always better. I mean, same thing with DHT, right? But by day 135 of the study, the 0.15% group showed a significant increase in hair counts. But what about the 0.25% group? Well, on this next graph, it looks like the 0.25% was even worse than placebo. However, if you look specifically at people with more severe antrenic alopecia, meaning people who are at a Norwood 4 or greater and have an age of less than 45 years, what they found was that the 0.25% group looked about the same as placebo, but the 0.15% group looked pretty good. Why that is, I have no idea, but it's good they tested it at different concentrations, otherwise things may have ended right here and now for SM04554. 
Looking at the next slide, the side effects were just some minor skin irritation, but there were no major side effects or changes in lab tests. So overall, the safety and efficacy of this drug looks pretty good so far. So let's check out the next phase, the phase two study, which involved 49 subjects with androgenic alopecia who underwent randomization to the same doses of SM04554 as the first study, but also underwent scalp biopsies before and after treatment, which will probably give us a much more accurate measurement of progress compared to just using photo assessments, which can be influenced by lighting or hairstyling to show a deceptive outcome. So what the results showed was that SM04554 increased hair count and again, the 0.15% solution seemed to do better than the 0.25% solution. The, the results don't appear to be very huge, but they are better than placebo at least. The biopsies also showed that there was no increase in a protein called KI67 in the skin. This protein is one of the proteins produced by the Wnt pathway. However, KI67 did increase in hair bulbs, indicating that SM04554 is specifically affecting the hair follicles, so we know SM04554 is working locally where it is applied on the hair follicles, and any systemic absorption is likely too small to be noticeable. So finally, we have a large phase 3 study that is currently ongoing that plans to enroll 625 subjects to look at the safety and efficacy, but this time in a much larger group. They're still using the two doses of SM04554, 0 0.15 as well as 0.25% versus a placebo, but this time they are looking at photo trickograms and hair counts as well as hair density and subject assessments. So even though they aren't using a scalp biopsy here, they're still using very good tools to measure outcomes, specifically the photo trickogram, since they use those in the clinical trials on finasteride minoxidil as well. The study is to last at least 48 weeks, and hopefully we'll get results soon, but as of now, I think the drug is worth keeping an eye on at least. I mean, even if existing treatments like finasteride, minoxidil are still good enough for well over 90% of people, because, you know, even though 90% or over 90% is good, it's not 100%, so the more help we can give people, the better. So even though I do think SM04554 holds some promise, I don't think that this will take the place of finasteride completely. The early data shows that it may work, but it doesn't look that specific spectacular. And it's a little bothersome that if you give too much of it, it doesn't seem to work. Because keep in mind, this is a topical we're talking about. If we're only allowed to use one milliliter, let's say, then that may not be good for someone who is a diffuse thinner or has really severe androgenic alopecia, for instance, because you know they may want to cover their scalp completely with the substance. It may turn out to be a good adjunct for some people, and maybe will allow people to reduce their dose of finasteride even lower, thus further decreasing the already very low risk of side effects. You know, if I were to say I had any concern with it at all, it would be that maybe I'm a little worried that there may be some systemic absorption. I mean, we haven't seen much of it in the clinical tri clinical trials so far, so I guess we'll have to wait and see how the ongoing phase three trial concludes. But nevertheless, since some people may apply this drug differently than how it is applied in clinical trials, some people may get more systemic absorption than others. It looks like this Wnt pathway is very powerful and might have unforeseen side effects on other parts of the body. I mean, after all, the Wnt pathway is involved in almost every part of the body, not just the scalp, including having to do with the development of certain cancers. So who knows what the long-term consequences would be of using this drug. Ultimately, we have to wait and see. The wind theory is interesting, but there is no evidence thus far that any outcome would be comparable to finasteride, which we know works extremely well in 90% of people. But in addition to that, finasteride is the only hair loss medication that has been proven to be effective long term. Even after 10 years of use, the drug maintains its efficacy and safety in over 90% of people who use it. So as far as SM0455000 or whatever is concerned, even though it does have some promise, it has a long way Way to go before it can stand before it can stand on the same pedestal as finasteride and you know that may never happen but let's go ahead and keep an eye on it nevertheless because who knows it may surprise us and with that i think it's go ahead it's time to go ahead and do some bench press and pull-ups because i think my biceps are looking a little flat so i'm gonna head out and i'll see you guys next time take care